بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد سيد الفرد والعجم والناس المعين وعلى آله وصحابته ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين الحمد لله uh, I first want to say that I'm honored to be here in all seriousness uh, partly because I'm very honored to be part of what's happening with the youth, these dedicated youth in Toronto. And I think it should give us a spark of hope that Islam does have a presence in Toronto and the presence is not uh, a temporary one. And I heard a story once of uh, some Muslims that bought a mosque. It was actually a synagogue and they bought it as a mosque and they were very happy. But the Imam who gave the talk on the first uh, day that it was open, it was like an opening ceremony, mentioned that we should be wary of being happy uh, about this mosque. And the reason is, is that this mosque, before it was a mosque, was a synagogue. Which means there were people in here of another faith who were worshipping their God as they saw fit. But the point is, they sold it. Which means, that there weren't people to sustain the synagogue anymore. And so that should be a warning to us that the mosques that we build, the Islamic schools that we're building, that if there's not a generation to come after us to fill those mosques and to commit themselves to the deen of Islam and to send their children to uh, the schools that are being established, then Islam will be in these lands like it was for the first generation of Muslims that came here and a lot of people are unaware of the first migration and if you've heard Sudi Manyang, Dr. Sudi Manyang from Howard talk about the first migration it's very enlightening to realize that in the first migration the people who came from Lebanon the people who came uh, from many places in the Muslim world Bangladesh, one of the first mosques in California was in El Centro, California and I happened to live uh, in that area and I met a lot of people named Lydia Muhammad and John Saeed and I asked them how did you get these names and they said our fathers were our grandfathers were Bengali farmers who came to this place and they married Mexican women and they built a mosque here and I said well what are you they said we're Catholics you see because the grandpa died and uh, the grandma, maybe never, she, she never became a Muslim and she raised her children Christian and now there's no mosque there, there's just Christians who have last names that reflect a Muslim heritage. There are many Arabs now living in these countries that don't speak Arabic anymore and they say, well my grandfather was Iraqi or my grandfather was Lebanese or my father was Egyptian or my father was Palestinian but I don't know Arabic, Shwaya. Right? This is tragic because it's, a, it's a, a severing from their identity and that's partially what I want to talk about tonight but before I get into that and I'm, I, I want to cover some, some areas so I'm going to be going a little fast because the time is limited and it is an awesome to topic but I, I will say what I'd like to do and I usually don't do this but what I would like to do so people can keep me on track maybe is I would like to look at what's happening in the West because the problem or the, or the great tragedy of the modern world is everybody is following these people. So they're 5, 10, 15 years, 20 years ahead of the rest of the world. But the world is desperately moving towards catching up in everything. The good and the bad because there's good in these societies, there's no doubt. The traffic system works and we hope that Cairo and Lebanon and other places are going to catch up, right, to the way people drive here. But there are many other things that are actually quite frightening. And I just want to first state, don't think there is not an agenda. Don't think that this culture does not have social engineers. We all, we all know about engineers. Right? Engineers think things out, they plan things, they draw drawings, maps, and they show people this is the most efficient way to do it, and here's my diagram, and everybody gets the point. They have people in these cultures that are called social engineers. 
They work in think tanks that are supported and funded by these governments. And Canada has its social engineers. Believe me, America has its social engineers. The United States, they look at what's going on. They examine it and they give you plans. Now, the thing about these people is we often don't find out about the plans. We just begin to see them implemented in the public schools. And just to give you one example of a social engineered plan, values clarification. Values clarification came about because of the, the new uh, migrations and also because of the New World Order, George Bush's New World Order. I mean, it's not his, but he was the first one to literally come out with it and say it in his famous speech. There is a New World Order plan, and part of the plan is people have to uh, live according to this New World Order and what is called the international community. Right, the international community. Now, in order to do that, the Americans or the Canadians have to start getting used to the idea of having an international police force. In other words, a Canadian working with a Karachian or a Pakistanian soldier in the United Nations peacekeeping force. So you have to begin to see other people. Now somebody can say, well that's interesting, that's a good, isn't it, that we get to know each other. Allah says we created people and nations and tribes, so we can know each other, so that's positive. Well, you have to understand how they're presenting it. They're presenting it that first of all the problem is the word values. And unfortunately the Muslims have started to use this word, it is very alien to the Arabic language, it's alien to the Muslim tradition. We don't use the word values. The word qiyam in Arabic now is used because it's a loan word from 19, late 19th century and 20th century English. They hack writers in Cairo and Beirut and, and Damascus, translating newspapers and things like that, began to use the word values and they looked, well, let's look it up in the Maurit or something like that. And what do they see? Oh, value, qima. And so they say, okay, qima, we have now. The Muslims don't have that. There's no such thing as qiyam islamiyya, Islamic values. We don't, we have qawaid, we have rules, we have ahkam, we have mabadi, we have akhlaq, we have uh, these, we have words. We don't have to borrow words. Our, our language, the Islamic language is very rich. But we borrowed this word. Now the interesting thing about values, if you look at another word in Arabic which is fadila, which is translated usually as virtue, if I say to you, well, I have different values than he does, that sentence works very well in the English language. But if I say to you, I have different virtues than he does, suddenly it sounds strange. I have different virtues than he does. Why? Because we have a general idea of virtues. Virtues are not relative. Virtues are shared by people and understood objectively. They're not relative, whereas values are relative. They become relativized. So, well, his values are not my values, but everybody's entitled to their opinion. So what values clarification is in the schools is to teach people, yes, you have these beliefs and these values, but he has other set of values, a set of values. So truth becomes relativized and everybody has their own individual truth. Now I had to take a course by law in the state of California to clarify my values. <laughs> so the state is now clarifying for me my values. In other words, what he's telling me is, they're just yours. They're not universal. Don't try to impose them on other people. So when you see a homosexual, you have to recognize he has values too. And they're different from your values. So don't condemn him. And this is what they're doing in the schools. This was socially engineered. And the words are engineered, etc., etc. So I want to look quickly, very interesting, I think, at what is the agenda? Well, the way to look at the agenda is look what's on the menu. Look what's on when you're going to a, 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 so an event, you look on what's on the ceremonies, the, what they're going to talk about. Well, let's look at what the United Nations in the 1990s have had their summits on. The UN Summit on Biodiversity. The UN Summit on the Family. The UN Summit on Population Control. 
the UN summit on sustainable development, the UN summit on the rights of women, the UN summit on housing, the UN summit on the environment, the UN summit on education, the UN summit on global warming. There's an agenda there. And the agenda, if you look at that, at the center and at the heart of these summits is the family. Because they have one on biodiversity, the family itself, population control related to what we're going to do about this problem of overpopulation. Not in Germany, where they're encouraging and paying money to have children because they're so worried about their low population. But the brown people that are proliferating too fast. Right? They're not talking about population control in the industrialized countries, but they're talking about population control in other places in the world. So this is the agenda. Now, just to look at, there's the agenda. Well, let's look what's happening and what's a result of the previous agendas, because they've been doing their social engineering for some time. Pleasanton is a city in the Bay Area. It's got one of the most affluent uh, parts of the Bay Area, very wealthy people, upper middle class to uh, rich people, and they did a study there. Pleasanton teens detail drug use, sexual activity. 7% have tried suicide in Pleasanton. 7%. And suicide now, for the first time, they're seeing suicide in six, seven year olds. Um, Prozac is now, thank God, we've just discovered a drug that works in children, because prior to that, antidepressants didn't work for little children. Right? Now Prozac is being tested on children, so we don't have to worry about their depression anymore, right? We can just give them drugs. Now, this is a very interesting study. Used marijuana during the last month. Los Angeles, 21%. San Francisco, 18%. San Diego, 27%. It's right next to the border, right? Tijuana. <laughs> That's where the marijuana, a lot of it comes from. 25% uh, in Pleasanton and the U.S. overall, 25% of teens between 8th and 12th grade. That's one out of four. So if your children are in these schools, right, one out of four of those children are using uh, drugs by their own estimations. In Los Angeles, attempted suicide during the past year, 16% between 8th and 12th grade, 6% in San Francisco, 10% in San Diego, 7% in Pleasanton, 9% overall in the US. That's their estimation, 9% of teens between 8th grade and 12th have attempted suicide had sex in the past three months. Los Angeles, 30%. San Francisco, 23, 31, 36. US overall, 38%. 38%. Now, obviously, boys tend at that age, they'll lie about things like that because it's, it's a big thing in, in American culture to brag and boast. Right? And people who've gone to school here know about that. So we, we do take that. I mean, all statistics you take with uh, grains of salt, certainly, right? Um, they say there's lies, big lies in statistics, right? So s smoked uh, drinking episode, 25%. Overall, U.S., 33%. Sniffed or inhaled intoxicating substance, U.S., 20%. Right? It goes on. It's quite frightening. Now. Where do the Muslims fit into this? Well, believe it or not, we have our own problems in our communities. And as somebody who deals with these things and gets phone, hall, phone calls quite considerably concerning these things, I know very well that within the Muslim community, we have a lot of premarital sex going on with our Muslim youth. We have drug use. We have alcohol use. We have a lot of parental abuse. And in America, they have, by law, in the counties, child abuse, then they have adult abuse. They have agencies for adult abuse. And a friend of mine who's a Muslim works as somebody who's a counselor in adult abuse, dealing with parents that are beaten by their children. So there's a lot of rage there. So this, this is what we're seeing. Now, you will notice that all these statistics radically change when you have religious families. 
in the United States as well. These statistics radically change when you begin to look at Christian surveys, when you begin to look at Jewish surveys. Not an exaggeration, I'm talking about people that are practicing their religions and have religion at the center of their households. Now, unfortunately for many Christians, this was USA Today, are you a Christmas and Easter Christian? One of the priests says on Christmas and Easter, it's good to see you. By the way, we have a church the other 50 weeks out of the year. Now this could be the Imam on the Eid. Salam alaikum, nice to see you. By the way, we have a masjid and there's actually five prayers. Count them. One, two, three, four, five prayers a day. You have an opportunity to pray five times a day in the masjid. Right? So there are now what we call Eid Muslims. Somebody put it in a good classification. He said there's Muslims you see every day in the masjid. There's Muslims you see once a week in the masjid. There's Muslims you see twice a year. And then there's Muslims you see once in their lifetime where you do four takbirs. Right? And these are the categories of Muslims. You just pray the janazah. And I've, I've been at Janazah prayers where those people didn't even know they came, the family didn't even know what to do. They said, our father, and this happened to me in Santa Clara, our father was a Muslim, we don't know how to, to what do we do? How do we bury him? Do, is there a ritual? Do you have like something you do? They don't know. There are Muslims like that in the United States and in Canada and in uh, the West. And there's Muslims like that, unfortunately, in many other parts of the world. So we uh, have a very serious crisis on our hands. Now, if you look at what's happened in the breakdown of, of families, the first thing to remember is that the disintegration of community is one of the primary factors in destroying the family. The disintegration of the community. One of them is migration, moving. Corporations now control people's lives. They uproot people. There's very difficult times people have in establishing communities because they're moving and changing jobs constantly. So neighborhoods are not established. Neighborhood is part of the community. And so the destruction of neighborhood, which you still find in many parts of the Muslim world, is collapsing in these countries. Television has had a profound influence in radically changing the nature of social intercourse, not only in the West, but now all over the globe. People prefer to spend their nights watching television than social intercourse with the family itself. And most Americans are eating their dinners the one time that they have to spend with their families watching television, with the television on. There are people that don't talk. One study did, they said most people now in the United States have five minutes of meaningful discourse between them during the day. This is serious, very serious stuff going on. And people have to realize that. And the Muslims have to realize that if we follow them in their behavior, we will share the same symptoms of their diseased state. And this is what's happening. Now, just to look, if you look at what, what Islam has done, how to get out of this mess, right? The first thing, usra in the Arabic language means to bind. It relates, the word asir means prisoner. And usra is a binding factor. If you look in the Quran itself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the most important themes in the Quran is the raham, the arham. Every khutbah that the Prophet ﷺ gave when he married people, khutbatul uh, 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 azawaj, the Prophet ﷺ quoted the ayah, Ya ayyuhan nas, attaqu rabbukum alladhi khalaqukum min nafsin wahida. He created you from one soul, wa khalaqa minha zawjaha, and he made from it its mates. Right? So fear Allah wa taqu Allah alladhi tasa'aluna bihi. And he, he spread forth from those two many human beings, men and women, spread out all over the world. It's amazing to think that we were come from two people. Everybody in this world comes from two people. We have an original source and their own material sciences have reached that conclusion. I, this, I'm not making this up. Their own material sciences have reached that conclusion through their own studies of DNA that there was one father and one mother of the human species. 
That's what they believe now. And why haven't we heard that? Why isn't it front page news? Why isn't it on time the news? I saw it, it was only a very small uh, article in one of the uh, side pages of Time magazine about the father. There's a book out called In Search of Eve, which was talking about the fact that they recognized there was one mother, but they did not under know that there was one father. So we came from two people. Allah made us from these. And then Allah said, bihi." Fear Allah, have taqwa of Allah, the one who you ask each other, say, Wallahi or Billahi By Allah I'm asking you Sadaqa fi sabirillah I'm asking you by Allah Wal arham And have fear of the arham Have taqwa of the arham Of the roots that bind you which are from the womb It is the women who bind us as a family The um, the ummah comes from um The um is the source of ummah The mothers bind us And this is why Awla nas bi sohbetakum Umukum, the most, the women, the, those most deserving of your companionship are your mothers. It is the mothers that unite us. And that bond is there even on the Yom Al because we will be called by our, the names of our mothers, the names of our fathers, we will be called by that. So we have to recognize the importance that Allah has placed in the womb itself. And the secrets of the womb are many. The greatest, as far as I'm concerned, is that Allah says in the hadith Qudsi that the Prophet ﷺ told us, Ana Allah wa ana rahman I am Allah and I am Ar-Rahman. Shaqaqtu Ar-Rahim min ismi. I have derived the womb from my name. This is something very powerful. The womb itself is derived from an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is Rahmah. It was a Rahmah that He created us. It was a Rahmah that Allah created us. He gave us consciousness. He made us into peoples and tribes that we might know one another. It is a Rahmah from Allah. The greatest Rahmah is the Prophet ﷺ who came to guide us. Rahmatan lil alameen. He's a Nabi al ummi the Prophet from the mother. Ummi means of the mother. That's what it means in the Arabic language. He's coming with Iman from a woman named Amina, the one who gives Aman. He's coming out of this womb, this blessed womb. This is the Prophet who came as a Rahmah for all the world. And the womb is a Rahmah that we have to guard. And the Prophet ﷺ warned us, he said in the Sahih, لا يدخل الجنة قاطع الرحم He will not enter Jannah. The one who severs the womb. And the ulama say he will not enter it with those who enter it from the first, with the Sabiqeen. In other words, it's from the Kabira. It's, it's a Kabira, it's not Kufa. But he will not enter with those who enter from the first people. He, the fact that he disobeyed Allah and cut his womb, ties his kinship bonds, this prevents him from entering into Jannah with the people who enter into Jannah. Subhanallah. So the womb itself must be guarded. What taqullah? Fear Allah. What arham? And have taqwa of the rahim, of the bind of the fat. Why? Because the community is based on the cells that make it up. The body is only as healthy as the cells that it is composed of. If the cells begin to deviate, it becomes pathology. Pathology is literally studying diseased cell tissue in the body. And as one cell begins to become diseased, if it is allowed to spread out and proliferate, this becomes cancer and it will destroy the body. So cells of uncontrolled growth will literally take over and destroy the body and deprive it of all its nutrients and nourishment so that the body itself dies. The social body is destroyed by the cancer and the destructive breakdown of the society. One of the interesting things that uh, Dr. Cleary pointed out about the Arabic word for nuclear family at Usra Nawawiya, right? The nuclear family. Nawawiya, Taqa Nawawiya is nuclear power. It's toxic when it's split. 
And a family that becomes split, becomes toxic, and the poisons are spread throughout the, the, the community and the society itself. And this is what we're suffering from. We are suffering from the toxic result of the split of the family. The children in these, in these cities that are killing people with rage, they don't know why they're killing people. They're filled with rage. It's an age of rage. And the Prophet ﷺ said one of the signs of the end of time, يَكُونَ الْوَلَدُ غَيْدًا Children would be filled with rage. And rain would be acidic, and we're seeing it with our own eyes. We're seeing acid rain fall down. Rahma is turning into acidic. The rain that Allah sent down, by what? By what our own hands have made. بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٌ He forgives so much of what he could do to us by what we deserve. So the destruction of the family is happening. We as Muslims know we have to guard our, our bonds of the womb. Now if you look though, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about jihad, about people turning away from jihad, If you turn away from jihad, what will happen to you? أَن تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَتَقْتَعُوا أَرْحَامَكُمْ You will sow corruption in the earth and you will sever the ties of bonds of kin. This is one of the results. There is a cause and effect result here. This is one of the results of leaving struggle. And it's not simply the struggle of the outward enemy, but it's the struggle of the inward enemy, the mujahada of the soul, of recognizing that you have to show kindness to your arham. One man, the Prophet ﷺ asked, about, he said a man who, his family is good to him and he is good to them, he said that's mukafin. That's a person who is doing what the other person deserves. He said, al wasu the one who is tying the bond, the wounds of the bond, laysa bi mukafin. It's not the one who just gives to the people what they, how they treat him. al wasu the one who is uniting the kinship bonds, is the one, idha qata'at rahmuhu wa salah. If the, if the kin bond, if the person from the family cuts him off, he continues to show respect and kindness. That is the wasa, that's the one guarding the ties of family. And I know many, and there's people in this room, and you know yourself, there are people in this room that have severed bonds with their brothers, with their sisters, with their mothers, with their fathers with their cousins, with their aunts, and with their uncles. It's happened. Because I hear it all the time. I hear it from Muslims. I'm not talking to him. I know brothers that pray in the same mosque, they don't talk to each other. Why? Why? Because there's no mujahada. And the best of you are those who begin with the salam. So we're in a crisis. We're in a serious crisis. The womb must be guarded. The mother must be protected. The environment that she exists in must be an environment conducive to the nurturing of a family because she is the murabiya. She is the one who is nurturing the family. The woman is the first teacher. And if you prepare her right, you will prepare a people that have deep roots. In other words, they're powerful, like an oak that has deep roots that go deep. The tree that has uh, superficial roots can be blown over, and this is what happens. So the, the bonds of the family are absolutely essential, and we have to be nurturing this in our children. So if you look, Allah has bound us together with our families. We are an usra. We are the usra of Islam, which is the highest usra. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ ikhwa. The word in Arabic, ikhwa, is familial. We are one family because our belief is one. Our belief is one. Our deen is one. The deen is one. The Prophet ﷺ said that the anbiya, abuhum wahid, wa ummahatuhum shatta. Their father is one, or banu uh, al-illat. They're banu al-illat. They have one father, but they have different mothers. In other words, their father is tawheed. And the mothers are the different sharia, the different laws that they come with. But the father is one. We are bound with the father of Tawheed and the mother of the sharia. We, this is what binds us and this is what makes us the family of Iman. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَى فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخْوَيْكُمْ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ وَا تُرْحَمُونَ Rahma. There has to be Rahma between us. 
But this is based on the Rahim bond of Tawheed that we come out of the matrix of Tawheed. We are believers and we are one family. Now the believing family cannot be sound at its social level if the community is not sound. In other words, if our communities are not sound, we cannot be sound as an ummah. The ummah cannot be sound if the communities are not sound. The community cannot be sound if the families, if the neighborhoods are not sound. In other words, the neighborhoods that compose the city you live in, if they are not sound, then the entire city is not sound. And even in these cities, if one neighborhood is out of control, it affects the whole city. People have fear. They live in fear. They have difficulties because of one area. Oh, that's, that's the biggest problem we have in the city. And people know those areas in their cities. The city has to be sound. The city is not sound if the neighborhoods are not sound. The neighborhoods are not sound if the families are not sound. The families are not sound if the relationship of the members of the families are not sound. They are not sound if the individuals that compose those families are not sound. And the Arabic word for sound is sahih, sahih. And it's a word related to siha, to health. What is health? In Islam, health is believing la ilaha illallah and acting according to la ilaha illallah by believing Muhammad Rasulullah and acting according to Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is the believers, they are those who have Allah and His Messenger decree something, they follow that. We are severing our ties. We're not training our children the way Allah has commanded us to train them. We're not treating our women the way Allah has commanded us to treat them. Our women are not treating their husbands the way Allah has commanded them to treat them. There's a breakdown at all levels and we suffer from it. Each one of us suffers from it. The community suffers from it. Ultimately, the ummah itself suffers from it. The Prophet Wasallam on his deathbed, what did he say? On his deathbed, his last words according to the hadith in Nasa'i and Ibn Majah, as salah as salah prayer, prayer. The last words of our messenger. On his deathbed, the last words of our messenger is nasiha before he leaves this ummah. Nasiha to the people he loves. His ummah, as salah as salah not ah, uh, ah. Uh. And I've seen many people die. I worked in a critical care unit. I've watched people die. Their last words are not words of advice to other people. His last words, as salah as salah guard your prayer, guard your prayer. وَمَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ لَا تُكَلِّفُوهُمْ بِمَا لَا يَطِيقُونَ And those who your right hands possess, don't burden them more than they can bear. Your servants, treat your servants, those below you, treat them well. النِّسَاء Allah, Allah, the Nisa. This is the last thing our messenger said. Allah, Allah, the Nisa. Fear Allah in your women. Fear Allah in your women. Fear Allah in your women. They are in your hands. You have made the wombs that they possess halal by the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we marry with the ahad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he died. The last breath of our messenger. These were the words he said. Prayer the poor and, the, and the, those lower than you, treat them well. And the last thing, your women. Why? Because they are the secret to the society. If you don't have women, if you don't treat your women well, you won't have children. If you don't have children, you have no society. You have no society. Because they are the next generation. Allahu Akbar. Beginning with the prayer and ending with women. If your women are not praying in the houses, your children will not be praying. And I know many people who came back to the prayer because of seeing their mothers when they were young children, praying, reading the Qur'an. I've heard this from many Muslims. They remember the righteousness of their mothers. And I know one man, he was a physician, he went to study in Ireland. 
Right before his mother left, she said, please pray, please pray. Don't leave your prayer. And he told me he could never forget those words. And he left the prayer when he was in Ireland. But he said, he used to say the Fatiha every night for his mother. And he ultimately went back to the prayer. He was fortunate that Allah didn't take him before that. But it was from his mother. This is what we have to recognize. We have to preserve our women. We have to treat our women well. We have to treet our women with respect. And we have to teach them the deen of Allah, the rights and the responsibilities. They have rights and they have responsibilities. Look at the one ayah in the Quran. They have the same rights and responsibilities. They have the same rights that they have responsibilities. In other words, the same rights that men have, women have. And then it has to be ma'roof, in other words, in a good way. It's not just giving them their right. Here, here's your nafaqa. No, with ma'roof. You treat them with respect. You treat them well. And then Allah says, وَلِلْرِجَالِ عَلَيْهِمَّا daraja. But men have a daraja over women. Now this, many men in the Muslim world, they think, well, there you go. We have a daraja. You see, I have this daraja. Allah gave me this darajah. I'll tell you two things about darajah in the Qur'an. It's a very dangerous word in the Qur'an. Darajah. There are two types of darajah. Darajah to takreem and darajah to takreem. Darajah to takreem is based on a, a gift that Allah gives to certain people with the prophets to whom He pleases. He raised some over the others darajah. The highest is our Prophet wasallam. And that without a doubt. But there is another type of darajah in the Quran which is based on qabul. In other words that Allah says those who make hijrah and struggle in the way of Allah have higher darajah than those who didn't make hijrah and didn't do the mujahada. What is that based on? إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ It's not based simply on doing the act. It's based on that the act was for Allah and it was accepted by Allah. Now the other darajah is taklif. Men have a taklif, a rijal qawwamun ala nisa. Men are caretakers and maintainers of women. Bima fatallahu ba'aduhum ala ba'ad. Because Allah has, has there's tafdeel there of taklif. And the ulama say, many tafsirs say, the taklif of jihad, the taklif of imama. Well, there, where's the jihad now? Where are the men doing jihad? And where are the men uh, establishing the khilafah? Therefore, where's the darajah? Where's the fadah? Where is it? You show me. Amongst the men, where is it? The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith to one of the women, she's called Wafidatul Nisa, in the Sahih. She came to the Prophet and she said, Ya Rasulullah, we see the men, what they do in jihad and they have all this ajr. What about the women? The women have sent me to ask you this question. And the Prophet ﷺ said to the woman, Tell the women who sent you and whoever you see from the women that if they establish their responsibilities in their homes, that they will have the same as jihad of mujahideen. And in another riwayah, Mihnatu, Mihnatu, Ihda kunna fi biyuti kunna, Tudrik jihad al mujahideen. One of you doing the work of the domestic work, that domestic work will achieve the rank of the jihad of the people making jihad. Why? Because those mujahideen are protecting the thuhur, the outward thuhur. They are, project, they are protecting the boundaries of the Muslim country. But the women in the houses are protecting the other thuhur, which is the boundaries of the youth, so that these insidious ideas and ideologies and misunderstandings and misbeliefs don't enter into them. It is the women who will give the talqeen. And I can see it. Sometimes my boy, he says things, and it's, I know it's I come in from my wife. But I, I'm not there when she's telling them that. He says things, and I say, SubhanAllah, why? Because there's talqeen, there's constant talqeen. You see, I said to my six-year-old the other day, he, he came into my room and it has a lot of books, and he says, he said, Daddy, I love your books. They're so beautiful. Because a lot of them are Arabic, they have a lot of nice gold and things. And I said, you know, when I die, they go to you. And then he said to me, and when Ibrahim dies, when I die, they go to Ibrahim. That's his little brother. You see. Children understand if you inculcate in them these things. He's six years old, but already 
he's beginning to understand these things. We have to teach our children these things. We have to inculcate in them that they will die, that they're responsible. At the time they reach puberty, they are responsible. Now if you look at other aspects, I mean I could go on about these things, and, and uh, I, the time's limited, so I'm going to finish this, in fact, because I really want to see these slides, because I think they're very profound and, and beneficial. The last thing I want to say, and I want everybody after they hear this, just to say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu there is a verse in the Quran in Surah Al Ahzab in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it's the prohibition of adoption. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah did not make those who you claim to be your children your children. In other words, they did not come from wombs that you inseminated. Allah did not make them your children. That is just a word that's coming out of your mouth. It's a lie. Wallahu yaqul al haq. In other words, it is not true. Allah is clarifying it. So before them doing that, the hukum is not clear. So when the Prophet said Zayd ibn Muhammad, he was not lying. Don't misunderstand that. But Allah now is clarifying the hukum. You can't say this. And now he's no longer Zayd ibn Muhammad, he's Zayd ibn Haritha. The Prophet called him Zayd ibn Muhammad. He adopted him. And that was something that the, the Arabs used to do before his Sharia ah clarified the matter. Now the Orientalist has always used this. If you read Orientalist literature, they always use this as this they want to get in there and dig a little bit, right? About this issue of Zayd and, and Zainab bin Jahash. Very interesting. Why is this so central and important? Allah says after that, well, He's guiding you to the straight path. He's, Allah is telling you this not because He doesn't like it. He's guiding you to a straight path that will make you upright. Call your children by their fathers. Ad'uhum, call them, not your children. Call them li'aba'ihim huwa aqsatu Allah. This is more just with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And qasat is about giving things their due. So, and then Allah says, فَإِنَّمْ تَعْلَمُوا آبَاءَهُمْ فَإِخْوَانُكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ If you don't know their fathers, they're your brothers in the deen. Their deen is their father. The deen of Islam is their أَبِي الْإِسْلَامِ لَأَبَلِي سِوَاهُ سَلْمَانُ الْفَارِسِي My father is Islam. I have no other father but Islam. We don't know who Salman ibn who. We know him as Salman al-Farisi. Why? He's ibn al-Islam. He's ibn al-Islam. أَبِي الْإِسْلَامِ لَأَبَلِي سِوَاهُ وَلَوْ أَفْتَخِرُوا بِقَيْسٍ وَالْتَمِينِ Even if the Arabs boast about my father's Qais or my father's Tamim, my father is Islam. And when the Prophet ﷺ heard that, he said, Salman minna al bayt Salman is from my family, my family of people of deen. So, Allah says, if you do that, right? If you don't know that, they're your brothers in the deen. وَمَوَالِيكُمْ وَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَحٌ فِي مَا أَخْطَأْتُمْ بِي There's no wrong action in the mistakes you made. In other words, before this hukum was clear, there's no ism there because you didn't know the hukum. But now the hukum is clear. وَلَكِنْ مَا تَعَمَّدَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا But what your hearts intended. Now I just want to... It's very interesting. This is a brilliant article by John Taylor Gatto. He's a very, very uh, interesting man. Wrote Dumbing Us Down about modern schools. I recommend everybody reading that. It's not a long book. And he talks about the American pseudo-family, the destruction of family in the United States. And at the end of this, he talks about family dis disintegration. Is it receding or accelerating? The American adoption foster care business, larger already by a factor of four. It's four times great factor of four. So how many? Who's mathematician? I can't. Somebody. I know there's engineers in here. It's larger by a factor of four. Four times. It's four times, yes. Okay, that's what I 
four times. So it's larger by a factor of four than all of the world's competing adoption businesses combined. There's more unwanted children in the United States by four times than the rest of the entire world we live in. What that is, is news for the future because everybody wants to be just like America now. Right? Now look what he says about this. For 25, there is this, he said there's a bright red danger signal flashing. For 25 years, a substantial fraction of our total population has been engaged in ridding itself of family or wildly scrambling to add a child of a stranger to its nest. Making mother love dangerous, a dream of many minds since Plato, social engineering. We don't want mothers to raise children anymore. We want the state to raise children so we can indoctrinate them. So we can tell them what's good for them. Because mother love is very dangerous. It's dangerous. If mothers give their children their love, they don't go seeking for it from other places. They're secure in themselves. When mothers don't give their children love, they go looking for it everywhere else. And sometimes it involves doing crazy things like uh, becoming so promiscuous that they end up spreading uh, horrific diseases like this young man in, uh, in New York. Right? It's an article in Newsweek. It's a byproduct of our national hysteria about immigrant families from southern and eastern Europe who didn't act like northern Europeans. Right? In other words, northern Europeans are very cold. Suddenly all these southern Europeans start coming and they had these mothers that were very nurturing. This is not a joke. Now, Muslims also have nurturing mothers by and large. Northern Europeans don't like that. Really, they don't hug. Families, many American families, they don't hug. They don't hug. I'm not making this up. I know many Americans that have not been hugged uh, or rarely hugged by their families. Really, I'm not making this up. People find this hard to believe, but it's true. Now, look at this. When real families disintegrate or transmute into synthetic families, children are exiled from the only home nature will ever allow them to have. Christians always call God nature. Whatever appearances to the contrary, they become wanderers numbered among the homeless, and wandering lost, they wander eternally who they are. Now, Campbell, Joseph Campbell, wrote about infant exile, Musa alayhi salam. But Musa's mother wants him back. Right? There's a reunification. It's very important. The Prophet ﷺ is also uh, an orphan. Don't forget that. He's the greatest orphan that ever lived. ﷺ. He found you a yatim. Who raised him? Allah raised the Prophet ﷺ. He was raised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the social costs of pseudo-family are seen clearly in pathologies arising from America's synthetic family secret. Let me include these musings about pseudo-family with, with an inventory of byproducts generated out of stranger adoption. Stranger adoption was invented by the Americans in 1851. Previous to that, people did not adopt strangers. They adopt, you know, a community, if the, a person, they would take care of the child. Stranger adoption is where you don't even know where they came from. You have no idea. Keep in mind, almost all adoptive families are prosperous, steady people with a good record of community stability. Right? Many people who adopt are actually very, they're wealthy, they're stable. They tend towards social work, they ideal, possessing many textbook qualities, supposedly predicting successful parenthood. The, that preamble should make the following short list more compelling evidence about the mythology which teaches parenting can be made. Authors of a book evaluating family background of children who later achieved distinction as adults noted with curiosity the absence of adoptees on all lists of distinctions. There was a book compiled showing distinctions from people, right? They couldn't find any adoptees that had distinctions in different fields. Now listen to this, orphans, they declared, showed up more on lists of famous adults than their numbers warranted. In other words, there were a disproportionate number of orphans who had extraordinary distinctions in societies than there were, there weren't adoptees. So what's the secret? What's the difference between an orphan, 
An orphan is somebody who knows that he doesn't have a father. An adoptee is somebody who's being lied to and given a pseudo-father and a pseudo-mother. That's the difference and that's what Allah has made haram. Now listen, it raises the question, wrote the authors, as to the reason for the absence of unusual achievement amongst children who never knew who their parents were. It is a question, as far as I know, never answered. Orphan Voyage, an adoption research organization, is frequently asked for help in compiling lists of famous adoptees because, as the Los Angeles Public Library put it, names seem especially difficult to find. Orphan Voyage replies to such requests the same way. 35 years of operation have failed to turn up sufficient names for such a list. Doctors Crowley and Laidlaw of Roosevelt Hospital in New York received 5,300 responses from psychiatrists asking for their experience with adoption. It was overwhelmingly negative. As one psychiatrist put it, the maladjustment of adopted children is so extensive that no unwanted baby should be allowed to be born. Science Magazine reported to, to a Danish government study of nearly 4,000 adopted adults that concluded with these spectacular numbers. The adopted group showed 41 criminal convictions for every 100 adoptees. 41 criminal convictions for every 100 adoptees. Christopher Jenks, the well-known sociologist, in a letter to the author stated that number, that number was about three times greater than for the non-adopted population. Recently, child psychiatry reported that 21.2% of all first admission psychiatric patients were adoptees. That is more than 10 times their commonly estimated numbers in the population. The two leading mass murderers in U.S. history were both adopted as children. The bestseller and the band played on fingered an adoptee, Gayton Dugas, as the typhoid Mary of the AIDS epidemic. Dugas dubbed Patient Zero by the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, slept with about 2,500 sex partners, many after he had been diagnosed contagious. It's my right to do what I want with my body, he asked, when asked by, to desist by doctors. In the middle 1970s, three small European states, once leading adoption nations, set out to make mother love a little less dangerous by asking circumstances of new mothers pleasant enough to convince them not to abandon their babies. In 10 short years, Sweden, Norway, and Holland cut the rate of domestic adoption to nearly zero because they saw that adoption was having disastrous effects on the adoptees. This is, this is catching up with the Quran 1400 years later. Right? It's a little late. And this is what it is, catching up with the Quran 1400 years later. We've been on the wrong path less than 200 years. In the life of a nation, it's no time at all. The real discovery is, can we turn the clock back? That will require our government to follow the path of Sweden, Norway, and Holland have done, and it will probably require our corporate economy to recognize that emotional rationality is considered more important than accountant rationality. Only then can it begin to reorganize to produce human quality by keeping families intact instead of producing maximum material profit by destroying them. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa Muhammad rasulullah. Wallahi, this is people we should rejoice. Abshuru, Allah sent us guidance 1400 years ago, told us don't do this, do that. Why? Now we get, we have, we have to have non-Muslims telling us why. Really? Why did Allah say don't call them by pseudo you're not, you're a pseudo-father. It's not real. And so you don't call them. They're orphans and you take care of them. So, um, before ending, I just want to go through these. If you can uh, just turn the lights, if, if that's possible. Um, this place is a, an extraordinary place. It's one of the only places that the colonialists did not get to in the Muslim world. And I'm not making this up. They really, and you can see why. I mean, who wants it, right? <laughs> If we, my friend Abdul Alim, who's, who's a professional photographer who took the pictures, um, said he felt like he should have a space suit on because he felt like we were on the Voyager, just landing on Mars here. <laughs> and uh, you can turn it anyway. This place here is in uh, a place called Lahsira. And if people know uh, Muhammad al Amin al Shinqiqi, he's a famous commentator on the Quran. Uh, wrote a large tafsir called Abu al Bayan in this center of the Quran, the Quran, which has been published in. He, this is where he grew up and studied uh, Quran. It's, uh, he wrote about it. It's almost 15 volumes uh, tafsir. Um, next one. 
That's actually a student housing, that tent right there. Uh, quite literally. Uh -huh. um, this is Sheikh uh, Abdurrahman. He's a, a mufti who works for, in, for the United Arab Emirates. And that's also where he grew up. And he was just visiting with me. He's one of my teachers. And he's the son of Marab al Could Could you turn the... This is Sheikh Abdurrahman praying. This is a guest house for the school we visited um, there. And then the tent was down. It's usually higher because it's very windy that day. Next one. Uh, this was a man welcoming us there. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, he really was. <laughs> Next one. Uh, one of the students there memorized the Quran. Next one. Uh, these are all students that are studying. If you notice, on the uh, on, on the uh, the law here is is the traditional way that they write, and they write all that they learn by beginning with the Quran and then studying grammar and uh, uh, fiqh and hadith. Everything they write on the board, and they memorize it. And when I asked one of the shiuch why, even though they have books and paper, why do they still do it? And he said, "Tafaqnan bilawh al uh, because Allah used a loah when He uh, wrote. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used a loah when He wrote a board or it's, a loah is a uh, next one tablet. Yeah. Um, you can see very fine writing on the students there. They're all students. Next one. This is uh, Sheikh Muhammad Zain, who's a descendant of the Prophet and he's one of the teachers there. He studied with Murat al-Hajj. This was the first time he'd ever been photographed too, other than for his passport. 